Welcome back to the Rage of Aquarius podcast, the Outsider Astrology podcast. I am your host, Andre Burke, and I am sitting here with my lovely co-hosts, Rachel of Alien Heart and Frederick of Woodruff Astrology. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Good and to today. talk to you guys again. <laughs> yeah, it's great to it's great to uh, get be back in touch. Uh, we want we were, we were on a little bit of a break. Um, our last episode, I think, just took a lot out of us. <laughs> uh, and uh, and 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 Fred's been working on his uh, the, his uh, Dahmer book, so we've all just been a little occupied. But we are back, and we are here to talk about the Venus retrograde in Leo. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I feel like you know I've been giving readings all year. Well, actually since December and this to me has been the most interesting and the most exciting transit of 2023 so I think it's definitely worth diving into and just you know discussing at length um from a technical perspective but also a mythic psychological and magical perspective so I feel like it's and that's time. July 22nd so people know the yeah when this, July 22nd uh, to September 3rd to September 3rd right yeah um and you know v Venus uh, hasn't um retrograded in the sign of Leo for eight years mm. so this is a completion of an eight-year cycle of Venus which is very significant because she has traced the complete pattern in the sky which is known as the sacred rose of venus it is the most beautiful sacred geometry that venus actually traces in the sky and we will include a picture of it in the liner notes so people can see how heavenly and beautiful it really is but there are five petals that she creates in the eight year cycles and when you connect the dots or the points of these five petals you get the pentagram the five-pointed star that all of us are familiar with it's a universal mm -hmm. symbol and this five-pointed star the pentagram goes back at least five thousand years it's been found in sumerian artifacts and it's not a great leap to recognize that the sumerians were very gifted and very knowledgeable astrologers and they were clearly aware of venus's pattern through the heavens and had actually traced it geometrically and discovered these kind of esoteric secrets through these patterns that she created um so yeah the pentagram itself it's interesting because a lot of people associate that now it's just you know it could be something that represents satanism witchcraft all kinds of you know occult things but the real true meaning of the five-pointed star, the pentagram, is that it represents Venus's cycle through the heavens over the course of eight years. Right. And beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, the five points represents the four elements plus the fifth element, which is, you know, ether or spirit, um, that mysterious, ineffable something else that humanity also has and so it really represents the experience of spirit in matter itself mm -hmm. and what's really cool about the glyph for venus another symbol that almost everybody knows whether they're into astrology or not that circle upon the cross um, which has come to represent women in general in this day and age, but it's actually the glyph of Venus. And that circle sitting on top of the cross actually reads as the circle of eternal spirit sitting on top of the cross of matter, the cross representing, again, the four elements that this material world is created from. And so it shows us that spirit is attracted into the world of matter through the promise of love and beauty and that is the quintessential meaning of the planet venus from an astrological perspective an alchemical perspective that's the esoteric influence of venus attraction 
magnetism and specifically using the forces of love and beauty to bring or to draw spirit into a physical experience so right i think it's mirrored too in especially the weight version of the tarot when you look at the pentacles mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. that five pointed star and again that immersion of spirit into matter exactly that we associate with the earth element um but matter it's weird it always gets separated from spirit because of the mind's nature to polarize mm -hmm. but it's that like you say that attraction that pulls it in and then matter as spirit mm. which is um you know kind of does a number on the mind mm -hmm. exactly exactly so uh, venus retrogrades are they are the essential component of this tracing of the sacred rose or the creation of the pentagram without these retrogrades that pattern wouldn't exist Mm -hmm. um and so i think that's something to remember when you know new students of astrology are reading just very negative uh silly superstitious ideas about retrogrades being terrible times or <laughs> retrogrades being some kind of halt on everything in life that's good or important um it's not that simple retrogrades are not bad they're an essential aspect of the pattern of creation and there's a lot of different ways to interpret the planetary retrogrades. And I want to talk about many, but I just wanted to actually share that the completion of that eight-year cycle, which uh, began in August of 2015, that was a very significant moment for me because that's when I started Aeolian Heart Astrology. And the first article that I ever published was about venus stationing direct in leo in august of 2015. wow interesting yeah and i i was i was sort of aware of what i was doing but i also like didn't quite realize the uh, sort of transformation that had taken place in the house where leo falls in my chart which is the ninth house ninth house associated with publishing teaching writing and so i um unwittingly started with that venus retrograde i unwittingly started this you know new writing career teaching career and it was a surprise because i had thought that what i was doing was becoming a college professor that was what i was consciously aware of that's what i was trying to do purposefully and my life took a completely different turn and it was in perfect alignment with that retrograde through my ninth house and then Venus's reemergence as Morning Star, and I was suddenly inspired for the very first time to write my own article and publish it and share it. And I had never done anything like that before. And it wasn't peer reviewed. <laughs> That's right. Thank the Lord. Um, and it just <laughs> it just started, you know, taking off. There was this momentum behind it. Just it all lined up. And so I just wanted to share that because that is significant for me in terms of what actually came into fruition. Um, and I want everybody who's listening to reflect on, you know, what was going on in your life during the summer of 2015, if mm -hmm. you can recall, mm -hmm. um, because that cycle is repeating. And that's not to say that it's going to be the exact same experience, but there will be recognizable themes. You know, there will be some connection to what happened back then. I think to that that's fascinating about the ninth house correlation like that for you um i, I want to just mention i mean it it's it I, I would imagine most people realize this um but for students or newcomers to astrology just to reiterate that the planets never move backwards or retrograde yes they're um in the their relationship to the earth which is where we're all viewing the universe from when the earth's orbit surpasses a planet it then gives the appearance that the the planet is moving backwards mm -hmm. um but you know i think most of us know that but just wanted to put that out there it's like that then, joke about mambo of tomato papa tomato and baby tomato baby tomato <laughs> falls behind 
<laughs> Papa Tomato squashes him and says, catch up. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> And then a quick footnote just to the notion of retrogrades, like you were talking about being negative or having an ominous sort of uh, taint. Um, my experience is that th that isn't the case. And also my experience is that the traditional uh, keywords that are brought up with retrogrades, like redoing, reevaluating, revisiting, rewriting, mm -hmm. I personally and a lot of work as well with my clients I don't haven't really experienced that kind of literal uh interpretation of the retrograde but that's just my experience you know yeah. I do think though because of when the retrograde period begins the stationing mm -hmm. where there's that period where the planet appears to stand still in that degree of the zodiac that is some pretty crazy ass stuff the mm -hmm. potency of that uh parent standing still and i think we should talk about that as we go too but i just wanted to bring that up as a point yeah for sure um the station retrograde begins on july 22nd mm -hmm. and the station direct is on september 3rd venus won't actually leave the sign of leo until october 8th so this is quite a long journey that she's taking through the sign of leo but the stations are really significant so july 22nd is the station retrograde it's at 28 degrees leo so you can look at your chart if you have a mind to and see if there's any significant placements that that will be conjuncting or aspecting by other angles. Um, I know that it is aspecting your chart significantly, Frederick. How so? <laughs> Did you have to bring that up? Yeah. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, it's sitting right on my Pluto uh, or Pluto in my chart. I don't own Pluto. Um, <laughs> so even though a Pluto and Leo person might think they do, but um yeah that's that's where it's sitting and i think anyone that reads my substack they've noticed recently that i've written quite a bit about these 28 29 degrees of you know any of the signs mm -hmm. and how power pack those are mm -hmm. you know just looking at what the essence of the sign is and then as it's getting to that perturbating place where it's going to shift over the cusp is mm -hmm very charged so I think that brings another oomph element to this uh stationing and retrograde phase because I think Venus will sit there at 28 for about maybe three days yeah before sure. momentum picks up moving retro so that's interesting if you were your own client and you saw that what kind of insight would you offer about venus state mm, retrograde probably prozac <laughs> and a gin and tonic <laughs> uh i would suggest that they look at he or she or they like look at what the balance is between their ability to relate with others and their need for for reflection and acknowledgement from the environment mm. just given the nature of venus and leo which is you know very warm gregarious and yet there's that um need to be a center of attention yep. there so that's just how i would view that in general but sitting on pluto i mean my god that's like uh crapshoot you know as to what you know could manifest there mm -hmm. as is pluto's nature and then andre can tell us about pluto oh, <laughs> as pluto and venus stationing there well oh my god <laughs> it's like, good actually because we can reflect on the last venus yeah. retrograde and tell a story which is in a different sign but it's always good to look back and just kind of feel out what happened during the last Venus. Well, sure. When it sits on a, a especially a transpersonal planet yeah, like I Pluto, yeah. I um, yeah, uh, just as like some a throat clearing preamble, I I 
have have completely had that experience uh that frederick described of you know retrogrades sort of not really causing that much uh drama in my life uh especially mercury retrogrades i think that's just because i'm born with a mercury retrograde and it just seems that that those three times a year when mercury goes retrograde is like when things get normal for me mm -hmm. um but the last venus retrograde um pluto it wasn't my natal pluto it was um it was uh transiting uh pluto um and when was this this was uh when was this this was like it was december, december 20 january. yeah it was december january 2022 uh, 2020 uh, 2021 and 2022 um and venus stationed retrograde on top of uh pluto who was at like 20 what was like 28 degrees capricorn i think Some, it was like 25 25 something like that somewhere around that La tail end of capricorn and it was in my second house and second house is uh you know uh personal resources self-worth hmm. um at the, you know it's it's one of the money houses uh and it's 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 the self-esteem house it's you know how much you can prove your value to yourself uh prove your worth to yourself um through you know your 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 uh works in the world you know right. um and at the so at the time i was uh it, this was mid pandemic you know and it was still at a time when everything you know the rest of the the, the world was starting to open up a little more but la was still pretty shut down and I found a Facebook ad uh, sometime earlier in the year for a free tarot Kabbalah class. And I'm like, you know, I said to Rachel, like, hey, do you want to actually go do something tonight? And and, um, and I was like, no, not another Zoom meeting. Please yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, do you mean, really? I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, go out and like, you know, she like hid behind the couch. She's like, no, no, no. We can't do that yet you know i'm kidding i'm kidding but um no and, and so we we went to this um we went to this tarot class uh and it's you know it's like typical like when you go to like a kabbalah class there's like there were all these like synchronicities with um with the uh with, with things that had been going on in in, in our lives things we've been reading that week things that we've been doing and you know um tarot you know kabbalah just kind of has that quality about it i think it was actually just a kabbalah class then tarot came later yeah it was just a kabbalah class that doesn't really matter because uh, what ended up happening is we kept coming back and it was at this small little church in Pasadena uh, It's a historic site. Uh, it's been there for over a hundred years, I believe. Uh, it's, it's just, a, it's a, it's a really like precious little building, you know, uh, they, you don't find buildings like this uh, in, in LA very much. Cause it's, it's not, it LA is built with this kind of like demolish and rebuild every 30 years. Yeah. ethos you so know we worship at the feet of anything that's a hundred years yeah. old yeah yeah <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> right amazing. yeah wow and it was an historic site like officially like a landmark um but it also was an historic site in the like esoteric movement of LA because Yogananda had taught there back in the 20s Manly P Hall had taught there back in the 20s it was a really cool place yeah and I think I forget his name I think it's Kalo Rinpoche he was the first Tibetan Lama to teach in America mm -hmm. he taught here he taught at this place so so we had something to do yeah we on had Tuesday night yeah and it was such a joy because we had nothing else to do we would go to the cemetery to go on walks and then we had this Tuesday night Kabbalah class um from February until Un, until, until December yeah until December so uh in while that was going on then um somewhere around I want to say August the the guys that were putting the class on approached me and with this um and, and asked me to join the board at the church and you know the the teacher gives this impassioned speech about how the the current board is corrupt and they are they are embezzling funds and they want to shut down the Tuesday night tarot class and by that time we had a small crew of people that had really come to depend on that for their you know for their their social interaction and you know we we were we we 
joined the crusade. I joined, I got on the board and obviously my Capricorn stillium, my sun and moon in Capricorn loved the idea of being a board member. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and it, we voted off the old board. We, we get, we, um, in, we did all this missionary work to enlist an entirely new congregation. We had what, like 70 something people mm-hmm. come as this, as the new, con- as the founding congregation at this new church. And we were, we, I was talking with these guys and we were, it was going to be this like esoteric, psychedelic, you know, like um, spiritual center. It was, we were going to have a school and it, you know, it was going to be a mystery school and, and an event venue. We were going to throw parties an old friend of ours ended up showing up to one of these parties. Um, and he's, uh, he's an interior designer. He's worked at like five-star hotels uh, across the country. Um, he's retired now, but he was going to come out of retirement to redesign the building with hardwood floors, all according to sacred geometry. He built, he drew up this beautiful, um, beautiful diagram, the schematic that we, we were, we kept in the lobby as this, like the vision of the new, of the new church. Mm. Um, and then then he left mysteriously and um then the vi- and and the, after we the vote was successful the vibe started getting a little weird and the two guys that were running the classes kind of got started getting really secretive about um uh, about you know the the uh the the operations of the church and the finances um Rachel and I had taught a class there it was it was the the best attended class um that that they had had like all year and we threw a Christmas we we threw a Christmas party uh or a solstice party um but shortly before that at the in the beginning of December the treasurer starts firing off on the texts about how you know she needs to be able to see you know the uh the she she had hired an accountant and the two guys in charge uh, just decided to fire the accountant at the last minute. And she, you know, the, there was this big drama through through the text. And like, I was just really focused. Like, I want to have this this holiday party. It's been a really hard year for everybody. And I just want some, something where people, everyone can come together. And so shortly after the solstice party, this was right when Venus went retrograde um, conjunct to Pluto. Uh, the treasurer goes down to the bank. And uh, gets Prince out a co- uh, to have her name taken off of the account, and they inform her that she cannot have her name taken off the account until there is they see the meeting minutes on ch- uh, church letterhead saying that um, we all have ag- we've all agreed to her resignation. And so while she's there, she prints out a um, uh, a bank statement, and she finds out that. Upwards of $28,000, possibly as much as $60,000 was missing and unaccounted for. In three months. In three months. In three months. Mm -hmm. Um, The money that Rachel and I uh, raised about $500 with the class that we we taught, and uh, we just donated it to the church. That was never deposited. Uh, The secretary, uh, who was the second in command, He had been running up hotel suites for him and his girlfriend, $400 steak dinners, $600 bar tabs, uh, and And ATM cash, ATM ATM cash cash. withdrawals, like eight daily ATM cash withdrawals, cartons of cigarettes, uh, you know, like a a $450 BevMo, um, BevMo, uh, expenditure. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was fear in San Gabriel. Yeah. It was fear and loathing in the San Gabriel Valley. It was, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. How did like, so the, how, what do you make as that connection with the, well, first of all, I want to say it's interesting in a micro level to look at the, uh, Sabian symbol for that degree in Capricorn, because it's a, it's a woman reading tea leaves. (laughs) <laughs> and that you know the symbolic the mm-hmm. meaning of that symbol has to do with the need to see beyond the obvious and yeah. into the deeper unseen yeah and that uh, levels of things so yeah that and seems, that is that's exactly wow. what happened because then it resulted in a, a drama that just lasted until the end of the venus retrograde mm-hmm. where 
we i we find out that these guys were not actually they were they were brought in as members of the uh of the church um and and brought onto the board through a, a former member who had made a sizable donation in in his will um half a million dollars. yeah half a million dollars and um they actually weren't members of this church there was actually a congregation at this church that had that's been there uh, some of some of some of them had been there since they were born back in the 1920s so almost you know a, like 90 years you know mm. um they were they, and they were all just a bunch of blue you know just just a bunch of like really sweet uh uh senior citizens you know it was it was not a cool scene at all and they were all really you know susceptible to manipulation and flattery and um, basically what these guys had did is is they they conned their way into this church and then they uh used some kind of legal method because there were there were misappropriated funds they the you know it was it was kind of like a battle of extortionists um the previous uh president uh, of the board was was um i don't know just doing some 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 basic you know like white collar shit uh, and she wasn't even making that much, but these guys were able to get uh, like a, a a restraining order against the former mm. board for conspiracy to commit fraud, and that's how they brought us in. Essentially, they they stole this church from these from these elderly people. Like you know, this they stole their their like new age this the new age their new age book club from them. That's because that's pretty so, much what the church actually was. So so how did you like see this as? you know the way it interacted with that part of your chart well like, do you know i what mean, I, mean? I, I was really high on self-esteem i thought i was really doing a good thing you know i thought i was really I, i'm i'm a board member now i have like a distinguished position um furthermore i mean it's it was about you know it was the whole issue was surrounded money and personal resources you know um so and it just sent me into such a dark hole because like i just started questioning my discernment i i you know all of the the self-worth that i had um that, that i had uh, you know built up all the self-esteem all you know uh the ego that i got you know the the puffed up ego that i got uh for for doing such a good thing and building community um and i do not have like a very community heavy chart you know like i'm i'm real really like in that uh you know, in, in that uh, southeastern quadrant, you know, um, uh, so it just it it I spiraled into such like such a depression after that because yeah. like I said I was just question I doubted myself so much you know how could I let these guys you know just uh, you know use use abuse my trust and use me this way and. You, know, you feel dirty when you get when you get conned like that. You know, it it really it's a blow to your self esteem. Well, like yeah, it's such a literal way of like looking at Venus. You know, the relational yeah, aspect exactly. Yeah, dipping into that you know thonic part of Pluto. Exactly. That yeah, is it, so primitive and yeah, yeah. But it, everything that was hidden, yeah, came to the surface. Field, yeah, almost instantly when she crossed Pluto and stationed retrograde. It was well, amazing. Yeah, I mean, and it, I just, again, the Sabian symbol just yeah. looks my mind. Yeah. The woman reading tea leaves and the whole, yeah. you know, the Kabbalah, Tarot, you know, that outward appearance, the yeah. exoteric part of these esoteric teachings and then drilling into it. And then it's just like a cesspit. Yeah. But what my understanding came to be, which I think is very true of venus retrograde cycles in any sign though it's always colored by the particular zodiac sign that it's in or the particular transits that it's making to other planets but there is this need that all of us have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves to really tune back into uh, the deepest part of ourselves to assess yep whether or not are we actually living out our true desires is this our true will right. is this actually something that we want to be pouring our heart and soul into and ultimately that whole experience was rooted in the trauma of the pandemic the uh, neurosis caused by being locked down and having no social life 
And the rose colored glasses that we put on just because we wanted so much to have something to do when we wanted to believe the best. <laughs> right. um, but no, like when all is said and done, after we got over the sting, it was like, wait a minute, Andre and I don't want to, we don't want to build a church. What are we doing? This actually did not represent where we really want to be heading in life, what we really want to be investing our energies into. And so we were basically living out somebody else's desire, not our own at all. And one of the things that I really feel is so potent about Venus retrogrades is that you actually do have this soul searching experience that does purify your desires or even lessens the amount of desire you have because mm. not like in the buddhist sense like desire is powerful and it's important and it's what venus represents is our longing to grow to connect to to harmonize to collaborate but um if you have too many desires or they're not really yours you're living out someone else's ideas you are totally scattered and disempowered and demagnetized. Mm -hmm. You know, so your your force mm -hmm. of attraction, your your power to focus, your power to make things that you really care about happen, to nurture and cultivate the things you really love, that gets dissolved and diluted if you're scattered all over the place, stretched in too many directions at once, or you're caught up in some kind of toxic bind with something that actually doesn't represent what you really want and so right yeah so the it seems the retro the venus retrograde cycle it it's like a fine tuning of mm -hmm. what a person you know it's sometimes by via negativa like not this yeah. not that i don't mm -hmm. want a church i don't you know yeah. and then the actual entryway into what someone really does value and want is uh, probably much clearer. Yeah. Because I, I think people don't like with Venus, they often think that, well, it's in this sign. And so these are all of these qualities, you know, that I have or value, but it's actually more like a beckoning into that particular, you could call it school. Mm -hmm. of the beauty or value that you know th that the magnetic draw that venus really represents mm -hmm. you know whereas mars is more of a pushing and propelling mm -hmm. venus is attracting pulling you in mm -hmm. to those qualities um exactly yeah. so that's been the the two most potent Venus retrogrades that I can recall, where I, I really feel like I learned a great lesson, were the one that I mentioned, August 2015, where consciously, like my deluded mind thought I was, you know, starting a, a teaching career in academia, but that too was a completely false desire. I didn't really want that. I was just doing that because I thought that I had to. Mm -hmm. It was the best idea I could come up with. It was motivated by not true desire, not heart and soul. It was motivated by uh, the need to feel like I was doing something that could lead to a proper adult profession that had a regular income and had some kind of dignity. You know, I was just trying to check a box that I know that I was supposed to check, like start a career. Right. That was very hard for me. I didn't know what I wanted to do for a career. I knew that I wanted to teach. I loved to write. I loved literature. I tried really hard to conform my true desires to what was available to me at the time, or at least what I thought was available to me at the time. And then, you know, magically, miraculously, Venus stations direct in Leo and boom, I'm just moved by this spirit to write an astrology article and the rest is history. My desires became concentrated, purified from those other ideas that were all just kind of weak, false, scattered. Right. And uh, that's the beauty of the Venus retrograde, which is why I really want everybody to recognize that this is a very good thing. It's very helpful. It's very healing. It's very powerful. Um, it can change you drastically, as it did me back in 2015. Or it could be something more subtle, like it's just a minor adjustment, a subtle alignment, you know. Um, we're not always so off our path as I was back in 2015 or as Andre and I were 
in 2021. Like mm-hmm. we were just off our path. We were having a side quest. And um, the the end result of that Venus retrograde in Capricorn was that we ended our side quest and got back on track. And it was really good for us because now I think about being in 2023 and perhaps still having these like awkward obligations to that organization and it turns my stomach which tells you a lot about where I was coming from at the time I was in a state of kind of desperation I was yeah well it's like the that that toggling between attraction repulsion you know something seemingly attracted to then flips and then there's that that repulsed element that yeah that comes in I think you you mentioned like talk you, you're going to talk some about um for the listeners like a sort of exercise that they could do um related to this Venus retrograde and I I, I take it that's like looking at it, what house it's occurring in and then if it's also touching on you know planets in a significant way through that uh, July 22nd to September 3rd phase. Yeah. Um, I'm not even getting that complicated. Um, although I, if you do know your house and if you can calculate the transits it's making to your planets, that's a really great thing to include. Um, but no, the exercise or the practice, I guess that I'm, I'm going to share is something that's based on the idea that the retrograde cycles of all the planets, but certainly Venus as well, resonates with the model of the three phases of alchemy. Um, In alchemy, there is first the black phase. That's where things are let go of, released, decompose, rot. And that finally gives way to the albedo phase, the whitening which is the presence of new life, light, inspiration, revelation. And finally, that white phase expands and comes into full bloom in what is called the rubedo, the red phase. But it really occurred to me that the three stages of alchemy could really be likened to the life cycle of a flower. And since we're talking about Venus and the sacred rose of Venus, Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be really easy to understand. So the first stage of this retrograde begins on July 22nd. That's when she stations. And between July 22nd and August 12th, this is akin to dead matter decomposing and fertilizing the earth. This is where old desires die. And that's what happened to Andre and I you know, when Venus was at the beginning of her retrograde, our old desires died. We no longer had a place in this organization. We no longer had a place at this church. We no longer liked these people. Um, So you let go of the things that are standing in your way, that are causing static, that are completely misaligned. And this is probably why there's some negative connotations with the Venus retrograde, because when we are unconscious of the things that we're doing wrong in our life, and I don't mean moral, I just mean out of alignment, the things that we're wasting our time on or wasting our energy mm-hmm. on, um, when you get confronted with the revelation, it can be pretty painful. It's painful to let some things go. It's painful to let your ego die. Um, so that period of time between July 22nd and August 12th is that dead matter decomposing to fertilize the earth old desires dying so anything that you can do that's introspective soul searching assessing your performance um because it's leo you know (laughs) assessing your performance to see are you actually are you are you coming from an authentic place are you actually doing this with purpose are you really showing up fully or are you actually sort of recoiling from some of the things you're involved in Mm -hmm. getting in touch with your true desire and and also being willing to release extraneous quote-unquote desires that are actually just scattering your energy diluting your energy so um this can be done through any manner of introspective work journaling shadow work and also it's a really good time in my opinion to like actually 
get rid of things that represent what is no longer you, you know, just clothes, jewelry, things that are just not you anymore. Like just get rid of them, let go, let that fertilize the soil. And then the second phase, this represents the germinating seed where new desires are planted and they're planted in this soil that is now fertile because of what you've released. So it has to build upon itself. If you've refused to release something, you're going to have like a more painful experience. But if you have just gone through that surrender, then the germinating seed in the second phase really comes into full potency on August 13th. August 13th is the inferior conjunction. This is the star point at 20 degrees Leo. The star point means that Venus retrograde conjoins the sun in Leo. And that actually begins a new 588 day cycle. Um, and this is the moment to plant a seed of intention. Now, my idea of this is that we don't want to get too complex with what we're asking for or what we're desiring because I feel like when we get too wrapped up in a complex need or there's this huge story attached to what we're trying to create then it just gets us more tangled up and we have to go back to like releasing we want to simplify our desires so on August 13th that like Venus conjunct the sun represents this kind of cosmic seed planting moment. And where are we planting the seed? We're planting the seed like in our deep mind, in the subconscious mind. And so I'm recommending that people actually ask for some kind of simple virtue, <clears throat> something that is mm, really simplified down to a pure essence that will bless your life immeasurably. It doesn't have a story attached to it. It doesn't have specifics. It's not overly controlled. It's something like asking for more love or more peace or more kindness or more generosity or more abundance, whatever it is that you want to attract more of because you know that will strengthen your ability to create and to connect and to um, you know enjoy the beauty of life, whatever it is that you need. And we'll have some kind of idea of what it is we're missing or we could use more of in terms of virtue by the end of the decomposition phase. So that August 13th Kazemi or inferior conjunction is a really powerful moment to choose something that you know you just need to attract more of, to allow to flourish within you. And um, that represents a seed that's being planted that will bear fruit over the next 18 months. And then the final phase, which in alchemy is called the reddening, the rubedo, this is akin to the flower coming into bloom, actually budding and then coming into bloom. And so this goes from August 27th to September 3rd, all the way to the station direct. And this is, we can imagine whatever intention we've set was is it's when it starts to fully flower it starts to manifest we start to understand that yes that quality is actually growing within me something new is coming alive <clears throat> sorry within me mm. and it's also um all the way up until september 19th she's still in leo but her direct motion all the way up to september 19th reveals her brightness as morning star coming to its full climax mm -hmm. so she will have throughout the retrograde not gone backwards but she will have disappeared from the sky she goes invisible and that's why uh the mythos around retrogrades always claims that the planet has gone into the underworld because it disappears it goes beneath our vision beneath our sight and then she switches skies and starts rising as morning star but that brightness is at its maximum climax on se September 19th. And that really symbolizes or really, I guess, triumphantly reveals that that transmutation of death, loss has now become new life, new light. And this is where, you know, psychological integration is symbolized. Um, you can even look at this as sublimation because sometimes we have desires 
that we can't necessarily get rid of. I mean, it's not like we want to be uh, without desire. Desire is what attracts us to to learn through curiosity, um, to connect with people, to um, open ourselves to experience. So we don't want to be without desire. But some desires are, you know, they can be destructive. And so the maximum brightness of the morning star of Venus can represent that you've actually sublimated a desire that was once causing you a tremendous amount of trouble, meaning that you take something that's chaotic or wild or out of control and you find a way to channel it in a healthy way. <laughs> like that's a real tremendous sign of growth, maturity, and of course the completion of a great magical work. Um, and then on October 8th, Venus actually leaves the sign of Leo, moves into Virgo, and that whole evolution that's taking place in the sign of Leo is now complete. Mm -hmm. So it's just three stages. July 22nd to August 12th is the first stage. That's just clearing things out, letting things die, allowing whatever needs to come up, come up and be released. The middle of this is August 13th, the inferior conjunction, the star point. That's where we cast a spell, set an intention, get clear on something. And then August 27th to September 3rd is when we watch things come into bloom. And from there, all the way until October 8th, we kind of just, I guess, enjoy the good vibes of Venus finishing her transit through Leo. So Yeah, I, I want to add too that um, the again, going back to Sabian symbols, which I find fascinating, which don't ask me how to explain them, but they're uncanny. Mm -hmm. The one for this degree in Leo is very Venetian in mm -hmm. the sense that, well, the symbol itself is a mermaid emerges from the ocean waves ready for rebirth in human form. Perfect. So it's almost like that whole, you know, Venus retrograde uh, disappearance, reemergence cycle mm -hmm. personified in the actual Sabian symbol. Um, but I, the the Rudger gives this uh, specific meaning of a very strong yearning for conscious, a conscious form of solidity. So something that might just be a dream or a passing fancy or that that work is actually done, just like you were outlining here in the three parts of the exercise to really uh, assist something into manifestation. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why I actually love retrogrades. Um, they They give us this ability to really purify ourselves, remagnetize ourselves, know ourselves better, align ourselves, adjust things. Um, and I guess that's why people say review, revisit, redo. Um, but that doesn't quite get to the heart of like the- Right. Concept. That's why those terms annoy me. They're just kind of throw away. Yeah, exactly. They're so not really doing the deep looking or work that's involved or understanding the type of process that's involved there. Exactly, exactly. So, but, and then if you want to add another layer to all of this, you know, wherever the house, wherever Leo shows up in your chart, that house is going to be the center of the drama or the process that's unfolding. Um, and it can affect a lot more in your life like obviously starting my blog uh, created quite a shift that sort of spilled over into so many areas of my life but it began the catalyst or the catharsis was centered upon ninth house themes in my chart so if you want to look more deeply into your chart if you are that kind of student then i do recommend looking at the house very deeply to get a mm -hmm. sense of like what process is going to be unfolding and how can I best attune to that, align with that, become conscious of that? Um, and, you know, you still may not understand because like I said, I I read the ninth house Venus retrograde 
back in 2015, totally wrong. I mean, I thought it was going to mean that I had some kind of transformation in my academic career, literally, like I was going to maybe try out a different school or, you know, get a position somewhere that I hadn't thought of yet. I really was stuck on a loop. And then throughout the retrograde, without me, I didn't do anything consciously. I didn't actually go through this process back then. It didn't occur to me. It just happened. It just happened that just something within me died and then new life was reborn and new inspiration just hit and I'm on a new track. It's, it's something that is very, it's very helpful. It's fun to be conscious of and align with and go through the process with some level of awareness. But I also have to say that it's not entirely necessary because these things are just happening. <laughs> like, As is everything in life. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you're going to grow whether you like it or not. But yeah, exactly. looking at where Leo is, is good. It's very helpful. And then again, if you're like Frederick or many other people, you might have planets in Leo and Venus will be touching that planet at some point because she's stationing at 28 degrees and then she's going almost all the way back through the sign. So the likelihood of her touching that planet three times crossing direct going retrograde and then crossing direct again mm -hmm. is very high so any planets that you have in leo are a part of this alchemical process mm -hmm. um, and you know the themes of you know when i was thinking about just what is leo like you know what's the sign of leo like what would be the dark black phase of alchemy with venus and leo and the film that came to my mind was sunset boulevard just mm. norma desmond all the way just someone who has clung to the past cannot let go will not surrender and has such deep unmet needs for attention that have made right. her crazy and perverse you know that's right. like I think the kind of archetypal Venus retrograde in Leo, at least the mm. beginning of the mm -hmm. beginning of the process. And so I'm going to watch that film between July 22nd and <laughs> <laughs> just for the catharsis, you know, because that's what art and cinema does. It, oh it my God. I just got a flash because I, I uh, just by chance watched this film last night and my mind was fucking blown. Did yeah. you guys see Tar? No, not yet. No, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, put that into your Venus in Leo for the retrograde phase. Okay. You'll see okay. why. I don't want to say anything about it because I, I just had fragments of uh, some ideas about it going in and I was riveted for like two mm -hmm. and a half hours. What's and about? boy, was Kate Blanchett ever robbed an Oscar when they gave it to... Uh, that crazy ass film everything everywhere yeah going into my brain hole um yeah th this film you will have to talk about it later you guys because okay. I know you're cinema fans and stuff. all right yeah. yeah great well I think we got I think we touched on all this stuff for the Venus retro any yeah. other stuff to add or well there is like the now quite popular association with this alchemical transit of the retrograde being described by the ancient Sumerian myth, the descent of Inanna. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that story is also pointing to the same lesson because the descent of Inanna is, well, Inanna, first of all, was the Sumerian goddess that is associated with Venus. Um, from an astrological sense as well. She was the dual goddess um, because Venus, of course, manifests as morning star and evening star. Inanna was a little harder on the edge than Greco-Roman Venus mm -hmm. um, because she was divided between love and war. She was goddess of love and war, which is kind of like the division between morning star, evening star. And it also kind of represents in, in the story, what happens in the story, which I'll, I'll tell the story in a minute, but um, that division in her being, love and war, morning star, evening star, it really represents the 
um, the unintegrated psyche, the unintegrated psyche, because there's such a separation, such a divide between these two qualities. And the descent of Anana tells the story of her punishment for her crimes, essentially. Um, Inanna in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest piece of literature that we know of. It's the oldest piece of literature that we have. The Epic of Gilgamesh tells uh, a story about Inanna where the hero Gilgamesh and his best friend, they are like, they're basically in love, Gilgamesh and Ankidu. And this is the greatest bromance of all time. It's the greatest bromance of all time. Right. So it's Gilgamesh, a good way to put it. <laughs> he loves Anki Du. It's it's intense. And I guess Inanna, as I recall, approaches Gilgamesh. She wants to sleep with him and he rejects her for whatever reason. I don't recall why, but he rejects her. He doesn't appreciate the way she's coming on to him. And because she's a goddess, she's wrathful, she's insulted, and she actually starts a war over it. Um, she calls upon her father to provide her with uh, what is called the bull of heaven, which was actually a, a god that was uh, the, the her sister's husband. So she calls on her sister's husband, the bull of heaven, and this you know wrathful battle takes place, and Ankidu is killed, and the bull of heaven is killed as well. All in this. You know, lust for revenge against Gilgamesh who scorned her and um, so the descent of Inanna is like I guess the it's the part two of what happened to this wrathful goddess after the fact and so the um, bull of heaven being her sister's husband is dead her sister is the goddess of the underworld she's actually the judge of the dead and so Inanna shows up at the door to the underworld knocks and the guardian at the gate asks her, you know, what do you want here? And she says, I'm here for the funeral. I'm here for the funeral for the bull of heaven. So she's responsible for this God's death. She's responsible for her sister being a widow. And now she's showing up to come to the funeral. And so she's allowed to enter into the underworld, but she has to cross through seven gateways before she can get to the throne room where her sister is for the funeral. And of course, the seven gateways are correlated to the seven planets. You know, there's a lot of astrological resonance here with the metaphors, but at each gateway descending deeper and deeper into the underworld, she is stripped of something that she's wearing, something that represents her status as goddess, her status as queen. So like they take her crown, they take her scepter, they take her necklace, they take all of her jewelry, everything she's wearing, and finally, by this, the seventh gate, they strip her naked. She has no clothes. She finally enters the throne room where her sister is queen and judge of the dead. And Inanna attempts to sit upon the throne as though she has power here. And so not only has she killed her sister's husband in an unnecessary battle but now she's actually trying to assert power in a place where she doesn't have any and so her sister and the judges of the underworld sentence her to death and they kill her and they hang her dead body from a meat hook it's really graphic you know they hang her from a meat hook and three days pass and she hangs there and finally on the third day somebody from the overworld one of her allies gets in touch with her father and again her father doesn't want to allow Inanna to be trapped in the underworld dead forever and so he sends these helpers to go in and and resurrect her which they do and she ascends as morning star Venus you know she ascends from the underworld as morning star the idea is that she has an unintegrated psyche she's been completely out of control her lust for love and war has become so, you know, chaotic that the only way to actually purify and integrate this separated soul was to bring her to the depths of the underworld, murder her, actually kill that old ego and allow herself to be like resurrected. And when she's resurrected, 
there's not a lot of stories. I'm not quite sure if there's like a super happy ending where she becomes a totally different person. But I think the symbol is pretty clear that she was purified of whatever was causing her to be so uh, separated from, you know, the original intention and that love and war could be brought into better harmony or better integration, which kind of shows the development of the concept of a goddess like Venus, who comes much later, Inanna is far older, um, and Venus is not associated with war. In fact, I recall that in the Iliad, when Venus tried to get involved in the war, it was really pathetic, and she really didn't belong there. Um, that was not her thing. She was exclusively the goddess of love. But I know that in the Renaissance, it was a big theme in the art at that time, that Venus conquered Mars, that in Venus's sphere, Mars was submissive. The message being that love conquers war, love is stronger than war. And I think that's kind of a similar message, like just that eventually in order to integrate those opposites, one has to kind of be dominant over the other. And the ideal is that love is dominant over the instinct for war or the, the violent streak. Um, so that's the story of the descent of Inanna. And you can see that the, the symbolism is that she disappears. She descends into that place where she is then purified through death. I mean, it's very violent. It's a myth. Um, but that her return, her ascent actually has purified her nature and brought those two opposing forces into better harmony. Um, so it is some kind of happy ending, but it's also, you know, it's a, it's a great way to look at our own ego. Like when we get out of control, we get really haughty or, you know, um, we get really, uh, wrathful or jealous or even violent, you know, there's something that's out of control, something that's unintegrated, something's not balanced. And oftentimes when we act like that, we get our ass handed to us. We get some kind of like wake up call. We get some sort of what feels like a direct punishment for being out of line. And mm. so the story contains a lot of those yeah. ideas and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, scholarship on these ancient Sumerian myths. Um, like the Jungians read it completely and totally as psychological integration um feminists have their own take on it but this is just kind of like the raw bare bones of the myth and it is a part two of Gilgamesh so if you don't know Gilgamesh you'll feel more sorry for Inanna <laughs> right wow okay I feel completely informed on every aspect of yeah. the upcoming Venus retrograde. That was potent. Yeah, I agree. And I'm actually really looking forward to it. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm excited about this experience and I want everybody to appreciate it while it's happening. Definitely check out the Sacred Rose of Venus. And I will put in the liner notes, the rose, as well as how the pentagram is actually connected within that rose, just for your enjoyment, because it's quite beautiful. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you, Frederick. It was so thank nice. You. Yeah. And Andre and Rachel, thank you. Another and thank you, everyone episode. out there in podcast land. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hope I am not taken completely down into the Venus Pluto influence through the retrograde cycle i will have updates for the next time we get together all right yeah please all right we'll be checking your instagram stories <laughs> yeah right yeah. i'm on threads now no i'm kidding <laughs> um god what a nightmare that is um all right you guys well until next time and to all our listeners thanks for joining us again and uh, stay tuned for updates through Rachel's site and my site, and that will clue you in as well as whatever you're following us with on YouTube about our next episode. Great. Yep. All right. All right, everyone. Great. Peace out. Peace out. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.